Uh, uh, hi, and uh, uh, good evening, uh, my fellow panelists. It's a very exciting, so I'm honored to be uh, in it. And I must thank also Mr. Kumar. And in fact, by the end of uh, what I'm going to say, I'm going to put him on the on the spot because he's a very dear friend. I'm sure he'll enjoy it. No, but Rahul, as far as your thesis is concerned, look, right since the nation's pulse was controlled by Mahatma Gandhi, if you're honest about it, we have witnessed minority appeasement, sometimes as virtue signaling, at other times as placation of victimhood. And I'm not just saying this, there are ample examples from Mahatma Gandhi's writings themselves about how uh, uh, extensively, uh, you know, he committed to virtual signaling. Uh, through his morning and evening prayers. In fact, at one point he said that even if Muslims were to exterminate all Hindus, he was fine with it. And as always is the tragic outcome, the Hindus have suffered, right from Khilafat movement to Rangila Rasul to Article 35A to amending only Hindu court bills, as you suggested, to school curriculum, to Hajj subsidy, to ignoring Child Marriage Act, to Shah Bano. Every single time the minority has been appeased, it has only emboldened them for further blackmail and at enormous cost for their own community. This is what is tragic. They don't even realize this. What is worse? It has made our prime ministers to go on to declare that, quote, I'm quoting from a Times of India report, Muslims have the first right to resources, unquote. Let us now fast forward to the present. You know, uh, we continue to ride the appeasement horse and yet accuse Modi of communalism. The truth, Rahul, is... And not many people know this. In fact, the BJP itself, for want of embarrassment, doesn't advertise it. The truth is that Modi as Prime Minister has done more for Muslims than he has for Hindus. Let me elaborate with examples, facts. Has he taken control of mosques like he has of Hindu temples? No. Has he allowed Muslim women to continue to suffer the barbaric triple salat? No. Has he disbanded the scholarship to Muslim students? No. In fact, Rahul, he has given scholarships to more Muslims than Manmohan Singh did. 2.37 crore versus 2.33 crore. Has he overturned the SC Sabrimala judgment and I see Jai there? Has Modi overturned the SC Sabrimala judgment to placate Hindus like the Shah Bano judgment was overturned by the Congress to placate Muslims? No. Has he reduced AMU funding? No. In fact, he has increased it, including a 90 crore topping up. Has he, who condemned lynching of Muslims at the hands of Hindus, condemned lynching of Hindus, Dalits and non-Dalits at the hands of Muslims or those of Palghar Sadhus? No. Has he abrogated the Places of Worship Act to allow Hindus to legally fight and take control of Kashi and Mathura, their holiest of places, cruelly demolished by a barbarian? No. Has he, like Dr. Ambedkar did, said that Islam can never allow a true Muslim to adopt India as his motherland and regard Hindu as his kith and kin? No. Has he brought in the UCC? No. Has he repealed the anti-Hindu RTE? No. Let us now, with uh, deference to my good friend Pawan Verma, let us look at Mamta Didi now. Did she change Ram Dhenu to Ram Dhenu? Yes. Did she say Batla encounter was fake? Yes. Did she oppose CAA that brought relief to persecuted Hindus? Yes. Did she appoint a Muslim on Tarkeshwa temple board? Yes. Did she provide midday meal dining hall for only those schools having 70% of our minority students? Yes. Did she curtail the time duration traditionally permitted for Durga idol immersion to make way for Muharram procession? Yes. Did she grant 2.6 crores of taxpayers' money to Purfara Sharif? Yes. Did she promise to give land to imams for construction of houses? Yes. Did she pay more than 10,000 imams, 2,500 per month and over 15,000 muezzins, 1,500? Yes. So who is more communal, Rahul, Didi or Modi? So for the sake of uh, everyone's consumption, and I think this is something that any, all of us can do as long as we have access to the internet and Google, just search for the Muslim Personal Law Sharia Application Act of 1937. Can you guess the number of pages this law runs into? Three pages. The number of provisions it has? Six sections. And you know why? Because section two effectively says that what is personal law shall be decided by a person who is a Muslim and who is competent to act within the meaning of the contract act. And what amounts to Muslim personal law shall be decided by a person who is a Muslim and who is qualified to do so. Which means the area of Muslim personal law has been effectively left entirely to the community and its own appointees and its religious authorities. In stark contrast, four successive bills under the Hindu court bill were introduced in the 1950s. The, the correction that I'd like to make is that it was not just merely codified, 
a good number of Hindu customs were completely done away with True. in the name of rationalization. And what is worse is that the community was never consulted. Today, we are being told that from farm laws to everything, farmers should have been spoken to. But when it comes to Hindu law, nobody was consulted. Only two people decided this. Dr. Ambedkar is a mixed bag. And in this case, he completely supported Mr. Nehru in his unilateral imposition of this particular position without any consultation because the framework was already ready before the independence. In the 1940s, Dr. Ambedkar had already worked on this. And some of his comments I have reproduced in my book, India That Is Bharat, which positively show that there was no consultation undertaken with respect to Hindus. That's point number one. Point number two, and this is extremely important for people to note. The question that Mr. Varma is asking is, why do we assume that this is going to be a reaction from the Muslim community? Why is it that the Muslim community effectively is the subject matter of the discussion whenever the Uniform Civil Code becomes the topic of discussion? Well, on a simple question of a hijab not being allowed in a secular classroom, this is the reaction across the board. This is the kind of mobilization that you see. Are you telling me that when you start a discussion on a uniform civil code, India will not have a larger issue on, it hand, on its hands? When Mr. Vajpayee wanted to bring about the uniform civil code, he was being told, no, the community is not ready. And this was in 98, not in 47, 48, 58, 68, 78. This was in 98. Today we are in 2021, we are being told the same thing. But the one thing that I certainly agree with Mr. Par uh, with Mr. Pawan Verma on is, I don't think the government should raise this issue without any kind of preparation. If it wants to discuss the Uniform Civil Code, people have a right to ask, how does it smell? How do we touch it? What is its flesh and blood character? To that extent, I completely agree. And there's a reason that I agree with, which is, Consistently, the Indian state has proven to be an anti-Hindu state when it comes to its interference with Hindu customs. Therefore, more than the impact of the Uniform Civil Code on the Muslim community, I am concerned with the impact of the Uniform Civil Code on the Hindu community because the standard operating procedure of the Indian state, regardless of the dispensation, is if I have to undertake a measure which is specific to a non-Hindu community, I will not be able to sell it across the board unless and until there is a compromise that is made by the Hindu community. Therefore, since this is seen as, sl as a slap against the minorities, the Hindus too will have to be slapped along with it. That has been the traditional position. Name one legislation which is Muslim-centric in nature or non-Hindu-centric in nature that has been passed since 1947, which has the effect of imposing even reasonable constitutional restrictions on their religious rights. None, zilch, zero, nada, nothing. As a lawyer, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this challenge to anyone who can actually confront me with this. The one legislation that was supposed to be doing this was the Maintenance Act with respect to marriage maintenance. And all of us know that resulted in Shabano, and from there it snowballed into the controversy with respect to Ram Janam Bhumi, and we are all facing the consequences of that. In which other country, Mr. Verma wants a specific question saying that Hindus are being effectively used as cannon fodder by a particular party. Sir, I'm sorry to say this, you have to correct yourself on this. Hindus have sentiments independent of the BJP and the RSS. And Hindus have certain issues with respect to which they've been treated in this country, independent of what the BJP says and the RSS says. The BJP Hindus BJP certainly BJP. have a problem with the, with the fact that over 40,000 temples are currently under occupation within their country under the name of the, people, the, the, the Places of the Worship Act of 1947, sorry, sure. 1991. Therefore, the point I'm trying to make is kindly do not reduce Hindu concerns to a political party's concerns. There are legitimate concerns. Was there a BJP in place when the Ramdhan Bhumi movement started? BJP did not even exist. Even RSS did not exist. RSS was founded in 1925. Whereas the Ramdhan Bhumi movement has been going on at least since 1858 when the very first police complaint was filed. So it is extremely convenient on the part of some of these people to reduce all Hindu interests and issues as pro-BJP, pro-RSS issues as if they are purely political. No, they are very serious cultural, civilizational, religious issues that we have a legitimate problem with. And in every other country, we speak of reclamation of places which have been taken over by colonizers. Bharat has seen two waves of colonization. I dare say three waves of colonization. The first by the Muslims, the second by Christians, and the third by Nehruvian Marxists, who are hell-bent on propagating the first two colonizations and changing the self-image of this particular country and its natives. That is a fact. Therefore, the point I'm trying to make is very simple. This victimhood complex is way past its sell-by date. 
because if saudi arabia can can take a look at its past and it can say we will we wish to move forward and this is not what we want to be for the rest of our lives and this is not what we want to be known for i'm sorry to say in this country where you effectively recognize three specific categories of ashrafs arzals and ajlafs well the ashrafs are basically changing so it's time for the ajlafs and arzals to change if the ashrafs are setting an example since that happens to be the epicenter of the global umma i think i hope that particular change cha translates to change as far as even india is concerned i just have one more point to make in which other country with close to 80% majority would you have expected the majority population to wait for 200 years to get one of its places out of 40000 places and that too through the court the matter reaches the faizabad district court from there it goes to alabad high court and then it gets transferred rather it gets transferred to the alabad high court in 1989 a matter that is transferred in 1989 after 1947 gets decided for the very first time in 2010 you get a 21 verdict you still don't have your land then you have to wait until 2019 to finally get it this is the extent of patience so after having been patient for all these decades so to speak or even centuries for that matter finally when the community says enough is enough we are only asking for parity not even preferential treatment and even if parity is seen as inequality and discrimination well then history has a way of teaching lessons and no constitution can come in that particular way because the constitution is part of history history is not a part of constitution please understand this i think it's extremely important for us to know that at times a community's patience runs out and here is an instance where the very same practice has been banned by the kerala high court and today we are being told that a school imposing the rule across the board not specifically to one particular community is being accused of bigotry and discrimination and it is standing in the dock there is one sensitive issue but that nobody has pointed out in this entire hijab controversy let me highlight this we are concerned about the security and safety of girl children 100% we should be now can we take responsibility for any acts that may be committed against the institution and its teachers by elements who believe that this is a violation of their rights we have seen instances where people have been butchered and lynched and assassinated on the street on the on the steps of the court for taking a certain decision what are we doing we have effectively put at risk the lives of people in that particular institution by blowing this particular controversy and giving this a communal nature and i've said this before another program i'll repeat this Uttar Kannada district this entire region has seen a massive wave of radicalization over the last two decades thanks to massive influx of money from the gulf and therefore that entire place has seen a huge wahhabization of mentalities which is why hijab which was never present even 15 years ago is suddenly becoming visible and it's be it's asserting itself therefore and and in this regard i'd like to actually highlight the work of this fantastic journalist by the name vikin anjappa who's written extensively on this particular subject when all of this is happening and simis offshoots are operating from behind the scenes is it truly our case that constitutional rights are at stake no i'm so sorry the country's fabric is at stake livelihoods are at stake our security is at stake and we are looking at the third wave of radicalization in this country which does not bode well under any circumstances yes no thank you very briefly rahul you know i i'll tell you what the tragedy is and here i would like to uh, respectfully rebut both of my uh, very good friends pavan ji and jay sai ji you know history for us is either to be hidden or invented we tell and retell what we like of it and of what we don't we scrunch it up and slip it under the mattress like a plastic bag now first to my friend jay sai he very correctly says uh, uh, to pavan ji that please dissociate hindu rights and interests from that of the bjp he is correct but i would like to add to that this side please dissociate hindu uh, uh, right and fight for it from hindus as well i am a proud atheist but i am fighting for it because i believe it is true it is like saying that only gays can fight for gay rights no anything any injustice that i see in india i want to fight for it tomorrow if there is discrimination against muslim like in the case of hijab i believe it is discrimination i am fighting if you are allowing other religious codes and identities or symbols to be allowed in hijab should be allowed in i am not a muslim so you know that it is it is dissociated 
fighting for a hindu right should be dissociated from hindus or bjp or any political party it is the right it is the duty of every indian to fight for against what is unjust secondly i want to come to pawan ji very respectfully you know he says he almost cushioned all the appeasement and pseudo secularism by saying that uh, you know everything can be sacrificed at the altar of hindu muslim unity i know he 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 cushioned it in a very lovely eloquent literary language but that was the essence of what he was trying to say so to him i would like to say sometimes i really wish i was born in another period rahul like 100 years ago 120 years ago to the period where people our great leaders weren't squeamish at all in telling the truth for example ambedkar i quote him to the muslim ib bine ib patria which is where is well with me there is my country is unthinkable wherever there is the rule of islam there is his own country in other words islam can never allow a true muslim to adopt india as his motherland and regard a hindu as a kith and kin was he worried about sacrificing what he wants to say politically incorrect thing at the altar of hindu muslim unity let me take another example there are two religions in earth which have distinct enmity against all religions these two are christianity and islam they are not just satisfied with observing their own religions but are determined to destroy all other religions who said this not a communal quote and quote hindu bigot or hindutvavadi but gurudev rabindranath tagore people must be allowed to say what they want to say without risking this so called uh, you know paragon of hindu muslim unity it is non existent for a starter well yeah. yes very quickly and i'm sure sai will come in fact i want him to come in because my good friend pawan ji is completely wrong on the meaning and the symbolism of kanya dhan yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean ki aap kanya ko daan karne ja rahe hain it's not patriarchal at all and a practicing hindu like jay sai will explain it further but i want to add to this when pawan ji says that about six turban and hijab it's a nuanced position according to me pawan ji it isn't it is straight because does sikhism the religion sikhism does it have a commandment asking its believers to wear the turban the answer is yes does islam does quran have a religious commandment asking its believers to wear a hijab or a burqa the answer is yes 24 31 33 59 does allah say that you have to follow each and every verse of quran to be called a practicing good muslim yes so all this essentiality of religion according to me is nuanced but it is worthless out here because it is all relative i want to follow a edict of allah i should be allowed if a sikh is allowed so there is no gray here it is black and white as for kanya dhan i want side to come in because i am afraid you are clearly wrong pavan ji there so i just have two points to make in this entire instance and this in, in the on the discussion of the hijab bro um, dr pavan verma has pointed out that hindu students shouldn't have worn saffron shawls well i think i'm sorry to say there is the newton's third law of action in, in uh, th- third law in, in action but there's something else to be said not one word has been said by mr verma on the stone pelting by the muslims in that particular region when the matter is in court and the authorities are discussing this issue with dignity and in calmness there is not a single video of the school mistreating these children they have been calmly explaining their position with respect to the rule to the to each of these children in the videos so what explains the stone pelting why is stone pelting the exclusive preserve of one particular community on a regular basis whenever there is an issue why are they not able to discuss these issues with calmness and dignity that's the question that we are asking i'm so sorry to say you're saying that all of us are demonizing who is giving them i mean we are not demonizing them they have they have given enough causes and enough reasons to basically say you've gone to court respect that particular forum and let the forum decide it you've chosen to escalate this constitutionally then why can't you wait for it do you want to put pressure on the court through stone pelting is that fair and i'm so sorry sir kanyadan is not what you think it is there is enough literature on this particular point kanyadan is not donation of the girl child I'm not the word dan has multiple meanings is. i'm sure you have written a book on the hindu civilization you know better